That's clever. Maybe we might just have to do buttons. This one's not going for us. I think we're close. Yeah, hitting the arrow. Yep, you can use laser. The laser's working. I don't know why nothing else is here. No, so it's just the arrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I remember a space barrel, do you? Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Sorry about that. Yep. No sweat. Check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two, one, two, three. I was getting, I was seeing a level up on hers there. Check one, check one, two. Whoa, that might be too much, is it? Check one, two. Thank you. 
One, two. One, two, three. Check one. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the launch of Newfoundland and Labrador's 2017 Vital Signs Report. Uh, my name is Ainsley Hawthorne. I'm Executive Director of the Community Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador. And on behalf of both the Community Foundation and the Leslie Harris Center for Regional Policy and Development, I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. This is our fourth annual Vital Signs Report for the province, and we've been really delighted to be able to bring this information about quality of life in our communities um, to the province for the fourth 
24th year now. Just to give you a sense of what's happening this morning, in addition to the people who are here in the room with us in St. John's, we have a live cast that is up online and people are tuning into that. We also have satellite launches that are taking place in both Happy Valley Goose Bay and Corner Brook. So welcome to everyone that's in uh, those locations with us right now. What will be happy happening over the course of the morning is that um, I'll be presenting some information on the National Vital Signs Report, which is produced by Community Foundations of Canada. It gives some useful context um, for when we're going into looking at the provincial level statistics. Then Dr. Rob Greenwood of the Harris Centre is going to be presenting the findings from our prov um, province's Vital Signs Report that we've produced. Afterwards, we'll be joined by a panel of community experts who'll be able to take questions, both from people here in the room, uh, from our satellite launch locations, and also from people who are tuning in online. So as you're listening to information, please feel free to write down anything that strikes you or that you're interested in learning more about. And hopefully we'll be able to provide you with some more details on that. And then following our official launch, we're going to be having our uh, first vital conversation um, which is happening here in St. John's, as well as in Corner Brook and Happy Valley Goose Bay. So for those of you who are staying for that, thank you very much. We look forward to talking to you about how we can put the data and the report into action in our communities, and also about things that you wanna see vital signs cover in future years. So this morning, I'm going to be talking a bit about our national vital signs report. Um, which is produced for the country as a whole. So the Vital Signs Program is run nationally by Community Foundations of Canada, and it has a national component and local components. So throughout the month of October, community foundations across the country are releasing reports on their local areas, like um, Toronto's Vital Signs, um, Victoria's Vital Signs, and so forth. So we're one of those local level reports. Uh, the national level reports for the uh, past three years have been covering the subject of belonging in the lead up to 2017. Um, this year is the 150th anniversary of Canada's Confederation. And so the idea to focus on belonging was to think about how communities include people and also how we as individuals reach out and connect to people around us. So last year's national report looked at how Canadians participate in their communities through arts and culture, activism, faith, sports and recreation, and volunteerism. Now this year's report asks what systems and institutions we have in place to integrate people into our communities and how successful those institutions are at supporting inclusion. So what is the value of belonging? Um, it's not just a feel-good concept, but fostering inclusion and trust is actually fundamental to building engaged communities where everyone feels they have a stake in the future. And research has shown that a strong sense of belonging contributes not only to health and safety, but also when community members trust each other, people give more of their time and money to support their community, social inclusion improves, and we're more resilient in the face of community emergencies. So the national report this year covers six themes. The top three things that Canadians say make a community a good place to live are affordability, public safety, and employment opportunities. Um, so while many threads are needed to weave together a community's pattern of belonging inclusion and inclusion, this year's Vital Signs research focuses on, um, on exploring six key thematic theme uh, threads. So the first is where we live, second, public spaces, then economic inclusion, migration and citizenship, safety and security, and families. So the first subject area where we live, um, it, it really gets to the root of the places that we wake up every single day, our neighborhoods and our very local communities, right down to the households that we're living in. So 63% of Canadians are happy with their homes. The average household size in Canada today is 2.4 people. This is very similar to the Canadian or to the Newfoundland average, which is 2.3 people per household. And this is really a change um, from the way the Canadian households have looked historically. So more people are living alone than ever before. It's almost a third of Canadians now compared to only 6% 75 years ago. And fewer people than ever live in large households with more than five people. Um, we've also seen a demographic change over the past um, decade or so where children are growing up, the children of baby boomers, and moving out of their parents' houses. So houses that used to be three to four people are now declining to two people as people are moving out of their parents' homes. 
when we look at the types of houses that people are living in, about half of Canadians live in single detached homes. This is actually very different from the picture we get in Newfoundland and Labrador that Rob is going to be telling you uh, more about in a bit. Um, more, more Newfoundlanders than Canadians in general live in single detached homes, and very few people in this province live, for instance, in um, high-rise apartment buildings compared to the rest of Canada. Since 2004, 2005, housing prices have skyrocketed across the country. Um, so this graph <laughs> considers the number of different cities where um, housing prices have shot up, but we've seen the same thing here in this province, both in the St. John's metropolitan area and in communities right across the province. We looked at that in last year's Newfoundland and Labrador uh, Vital Signs Report. In Victoria, British Columbia, the average house costs 8.1 times the, medium household, uh, the median household income compared to 2.6 times in Charlottetown PEI. In Newfoundland, the average house costs 3.8 times um, annual household income. And St. John's is actually about the same, about 3.9 times. So if you're thinking of the comparison between what people are making to what type of home they're actually able to afford with that money, um, there's a substantial uh, discrepancy that's increased in recent years. Um, housing also is a place where we can see discrimination and marginalization at work. Um, so for instance, 21.7% of Indigenous people live in homes that need major repairs versus 6.8% of non-Indigenous people. Um, so this will come up a few times as I'm speaking, that we can actually see the way people are being marginalized in some of these different um, theme areas. Shared spaces in places like libraries, parks, and cultural events are vital threads in our social fabric because they literally bring people in communities together into a shared space. Um, changing a community's physical environment can make a big impact on how people move around and how they interact with each other. So in the national report this year, um, there was a, a high focus on libraries, which is something that's relevant to this province because we've been having a lot of discussion about the relevance of libraries over the past uh, year and a half or so. There are 3,598 public libraries in Canada and 360 million visits made annually to libraries. Um, public and school libraries, however, across the country have experienced unprecedented budget cuts and closures. So that's not an issue that's only affecting our province, but is something that's happening nationwide. Despite the fact that 41% of Canadians are actually active public library card holders and users, and library use, and this may be counterintuitive, is actually on the rise. So I think many of us would think, oh, in the digital age, many people are accessing things online at home and they're less likely to go out to their local libraries. That's actually not the case. So in 2009, there were about 24 library transactions per Canadian versus only about 17 in 2000. And 21.8 million questions are asked by people in public libraries each year. So public libraries are still a vital hub where people are getting information about their communities. And when you think about the internet, public libraries are also a place where people who don't have internet access at home can access online resources, online communities. So they remain a very vital hub for community engagement across the country. When asked what makes a community a good place to live, Canadians said first, affordability, and third, employment opportunities. Um, when asked what types of communities people identify with other than geographic ones, our most common response is workplaces and people who share the same line of work because these are people we spend much of our days with, but our workplaces nationwide are changing. So about 48% of millennials and 29% of baby boomers work from home some or all of the time, and 15.2% of working Canadians are self-employed. So fewer people than ever before are actually going into workplaces where they're interacting with colleagues. More and more people are working in solitary environments. Um, income and employment is another area that's impacted by discrimination in a big way. So if we look, for instance, at median incomes, the median income of racialized people, and this would be people with some sort of um, visible difference, it's hard to um, find a way to express it, but non-white individuals or people who are non-white passing um, have 80 or ha have only 80% of the Canadian median income. And the median income of Indigenous people is even lower at only 72% of the Canadian median income. 
Um, moreover, most people dramatically underestimate the inequality of wealth distribution in Canada. So when you ask people how much wealth does the richest 20% own, they think 55.5%, which is already really high for the top 20%. The reality is 67.4% is held by the top 20% um, in Canada. When you ask people how much wealth does the poorest 20% own, Canadians think 5.8%, it's actually 0%. So when we're talking about people in the, body, uh, in the bottom 20%, those are people who can't accumulate wealth. So those are people who aren't able to own homes, who have more debt than they have assets and so forth. When we look at 6%, which is what Canadians think the bottom 20% own, that's actually closer to what the bottom half of all Canadians own, is 6% of all the wealth in the country. On the topic of migration and citizenship, 20.6% of Canadians were born outside Canada and arrived as immigrants. Now, as we know, this is different from the situation that we have here in Newfoundland and Labrador, where we have a smaller proportion of immigrants than other parts of Canada. And we'll be discussing today a little bit about how many people in Newfoundland and Labrador were, for instance, born in Newfoundland and Labrador as opposed to elsewhere. Most immigrants, however, have a very strong sense of belonging and substantially higher than uh, people who are born in Canada. So about 93% of immigrants have a strong sense of belonging to Canada compared to 88% of people born in Canada. And immigrants tend to place more importance on knowing their neighbors on a first name basis and being able to trust people as uh, factors they consider important for high quality of life. Immigrants with a strong sense of belonging to both Canada and their home country is about 69%, and immigrants with a strong sense of belonging to Canada and a lower sense of belonging to their home country is about 24%. Um, immigrants tend to display a strong sense of belonging to their city of residence as well as to their ethnic group. Um, but experiencing discrimination and racism discourages newcomers' sense of belonging in the receiving country. Um, the benchmarks of a welcoming community are positive attitudes toward cultural diversity, the presence of diverse religious and cultural institutions, and also social engagement opportunities for community members. So as you'll see in Newfoundland and Labrador's Vital Signs uh, report, most Newfoundland and Labradorians feel that they do live in welcoming communities. And some of this information can give us um, sort of uh, uh, ways that we can actually think about improving the ways that our communities are welcoming and reach out to newcomers. In safety and security, which is also um, something that we'll be covering in our provincial vital signs report, when asked what makes a community a good place to live, public safety is the second most common response. Um, and the good news is the crime is on the decline in Canada as a whole. So since 2004, there's been a 42% decrease in household victimization, 20% decrease in violent victimization, and 20% decrease in theft of personal property. There's been a 0% decrease in sexual assault, but this is a very difficult category of crime to measure because of reporting problems. Um, for reasons of discrimination and um, disbelief, many people don't necessarily come forward to report sexual assault. So if you look at the statistics from year to year, they actually vary widely. Um, and that is probably mostly due to reporting problems. Even though in many ways Canada is getting safer, um, public perception isn't keeping pace. So 88% of Canadians believe that crime rates in their communities are increasing or staying the same. Um, that said, most Canadians, around 93%, are satisfied with their personal safety from crime. But sense of safety varies widely according to demographic. So white Canadians are the most likely to believe police treat people fairly and to feel comfortable approaching police, while racialized Canadians are less so and indigenous Canadians are least likely. And we have an article in um, our Vital Signs report this year that actually talks about an initiative of the Halapu Cultural Foundation and the RNC on the west coast of the province to address some of these um, distrust issues between indigenous communities and the police. And, women feel less safe than men walking alone in their neighborhoods after dark and using public transportation after dark. And any of you who were on social media over the past week probably saw the Me Too campaign, um, where I imagine many people in this room and for men, many women of your acquaintance were coming forward to say that they have in their experience been sexually harassed and assaulted. Um, and the ways that women feel unsafe in their environments limits their ability to participate in their communities. If you're not able or if you don't feel safe walking after dark, or taking public transportation, 
you're just going to go out less, you're going to engage less. So this is really a problem with how we're able to include people and bring people into communities. And finally, families. Um, Income is a big factor in how able families are to provide for themselves, to provide for their children. 87% um, of low-income kids say that families like theirs will struggle to pay for their post-secondary education. 50% um, of parents say that their family's lack of money is hurting their children. And 88% of Canadians believe that families are under a lot of financial pressure. So obviously there's a strong perception that um, the ease of raising a family um, in this country has changed. People providing regular care to a child or a spouse who has high health needs, which is something that we see more and more of. Um, oh. About a third of those caregivers feel depressed and about a quarter experience financial difficulties arising from the health needs of the person they're caring for. 64% of millennials and 39% of people aged 55 and over believe that family is whoever you choose to surround yourself with. So more people are creating their own families um, and defining families in a new way other than just biological families. But in the last 20 years, the proportion of 11 to 15 year olds that feel understood by their parents has actually increased. So despite the myth of teenagers and parents never getting along, that is actually something that is currently shifting in the Canadian landscape, which is sort of an interesting piece of data. So in conclusion, um, our population has risen substantially since uh, Canada's 100th anniversary in 1967 um, by about 15 million people nationwide. Um, and based on people's re survey responses, 38% of Canadians don't feel like they have a strong stake in their local community. Only half of Canadians think that being involved in community events or activities is, is important. So as we move into the consideration of our Provincial Vital Signs Report today and the community conversation that we're going to be having afterwards, um, one of the key things that we'd like people to think about is steps that we can take to change the institutions in our communities um, in order to make them place is where everyone has a higher standard of living, higher quality of life, and also feels socially integrated so that we can avoid social exclusion. So thank you all again for turning out here today and for tuning in online if you're joining us that way. Um, so now I will be passing the mic over to Rob Greenwood, who is going to be um, telling us about our Provincial Vital Science Report. Thank you very much, Rob. Alrighty. Thanks, Ainsley, and great to be back again for another uh, pr production of Vital Signs. It's been a really fantastic uh, partnership between the Harris Center and the Community Foundation of Newfoundland Labrador. And uh, just the turnout we get at these events and the traction we have with governments, businesses, industry associations, non-governmental organizations, uh, the media, it, uh, it really is a superb channel to foster debate, discussion, and uh, greater understanding of our province. So uh, lots of great information there from Ainsley on the national scene. So I'm going to walk you through some of what's in this year's Vital Signs and give you some of my color commentary, but we're going to have lots of opportunity for Q&A with the panel, but also afterwards with the breakout sessions to talk about what have we learned from this year, how can we put it to use, and also any ideas for, for next year and beyond. Oh, John said to call you in. Oh, I'm using the clicker. Space bar. Space bar. Space bar, you're good. You sure? Hang on, we'll get you back to number two. There you go. Okay, I'm looking at the screen. Yeah, sorry. I need a lot of help. <laughs> Goes without saying. Uh, first of all, Thanking key funders and supporters and partners. Uh, I have to admit, and I've mentioned to Steve, I was concerned when I heard about the, the Telegram and the other papers in the province being bought by a company in Nova Scotia. The, the, the partnership has only been strengthened. Saltwire has really shown its commitment to local content, local partnerships. And uh, so we really see it building on the strength of what we had already established and going even stronger. So that's been there from the beginning with Vital Signs, couldn't happen without it. And Steve in particular has been a superb champion for this. So uh, thank you for that. Our design partner this year, a perfect day, put in tons of work 
helping to create the beautiful product that we have there. And the funding partners, which we can't do without, uh, Municipalities Newfoundland Labrador and the Munn Faculty of Medicine have been with us from day one every year. Thank you so much. The YMCA has been with us for three years. Thank you, Jason, and uh, can't thank you enough for that support. Uh, Choices, Choices for Youth have been uh, great repeat supporters, I think three times. Uh, and this year we also have uh, the Community Fund for Canada 150, a uh, partnership with the Community Foundation of Canada, with the Government of Canada. So, you know, this year, as we all know, finances are tight and it really means a lot for these organizations to work with us to produce what is really a community-based project. And so, uh, thank you so much. Okay, got everybody? get into the content, and I think I do have a laser here. <clears throat> the demographics, of course, are always fascinating. And so uh, 20 to 30 year olds in this province, in a village of 100, the percent would be five. 15 to 64, 66. 65 plus, 20. And then under 15, 14. And I looked back at our four or three previous vital signs, did a little matrix of all the categories and stuff we've looked at, and I'll talk some more about that. Uh, but when I looked at 19 or 2014, rather, uh, those 65 plus in 2014, not that long ago, of a community of 100, 16, today 20. So we know with the boomers moving on every year, all of us, if we're lucky. Uh, that proportion becomes even bigger. So that's, that was really telling for me, looking at that. Uh, low income, out of and uh, Helena, when we get on the panel, if anybody has any questions, because of course with the data, you always need to unpack what the definitions mean. Uh, 15 out of 100, low income. And uh, that is really telling in a province that has enjoyed a very good run up to the last couple of years. Um, the uh, Also interesting when you look at the... Uh, the 65 plus out of 100, one currently in a nursing home. And that's one I suggest to you is going to grow increasingly year after year for the next 15 years for sure. So if you're looking for an investment opportunity, tough business to get into, but uh, gonna be really, uh, really important. Um, the, uh, my eyes are getting worse all the time. <laughs> 46 who volunteer, and we'll come back to that more in the uh, in the slides as we go. And uh, this bubble diagram always generates loads of, so look at it in the paper and, and see what you think. But this one also, and we have some more stuff here on sense of belonging, and it goes back to what uh, Ainsley said for Canada as a whole, but really interesting, Newfoundland and Labrador, 66 who see uh, belonging to Canada as a very strong connection versus 65 belonging to the province. And it's not either or, obviously the numbers don't add up to a, a total of 100, so they didn't ask people to weight them. Uh, really interesting though, when you look at to local community versus to province versus to Canada as a whole, and it's for the West, Ontario, Quebec, Maritimes, Newfoundland, Labrador, and then the Canadian average. Commitment, sense of belonging to local community, and that can be defined in various ways. Your individual dot on the map, or the, the locality or the region. So that's left for people to self-define. But 47% in Newfoundland and Labrador, that commitment to local, uh, by far the highest in the country. Um, and yet that doesn't mean not committed to the province, 65%. And indeed for the country, even higher. So we can have multiple sets of commitments but it really is telling, I think, that that strong sense of commitment to community is alive and well in Newfoundland and Labrador and is a real strength and a real opportunity for us to build on. I found it disconcerting, some of the last stats uh, Ainsley said for Canada as a whole, where 50%, I think it was, don't feel it's important. And, and that scares me. You know, we all go back to the famous uh, book by Putnam, Bowling Alone, where the membership in bowling leagues had gone down in the US and the various other mechanisms that people use to come together. And so we're all watching Netflix. We're all watching our own specialized on the web stuff. <clears throat> Families are smaller. And so how we create those connections on belonging is really what drove this whole report. 
But I think in Newfoundland and Labrador, thank God, we still have a lot of strengths we can really build on. In terms of personal economy, not really surprising in light of the situation we're in in the province right now. Uh, highlights the lack of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians' sense of financial security during the current slump. This is very recent perception data by the local firm MQO. It's from July 2017, hot off the press. And in terms of comparison to each of the other Atlantic provinces, Newfoundland Labrador on the left, then Nova Scotia, then New Brunswick, then PEI, how likely to make a major purchase? 15% Newfoundland, 18% Nova Scotia, and PEI. Very concerned about the cost of living. 56% in Newfoundland Labrador, you can see drop significantly for the other provinces. Feeling very secure in employment. 48% in Newfoundland Labrador, 70% in PEI. So people are feeling the current situation. Uh, perceptions sometimes are lined up with the, uh, the data, sometimes they're not. Um, on the next slide, it drills into a little bit more on the, uh, the challenges for, uh, for various young adults in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, th there's a, and the, the quote is from the National Advocacy Group, Generation Squeeze, raising awareness on how this generation is less financially stable than their parents, even though, according to the national stats, they're, they're talking to each other. Um, there's a challenging job market, there's student debt, there's cost of housing, make it all harder for young people to get a good start. And we see lots in the media these days and the reality about precarious employment. Dental plan jobs are harder to get. Defined benefit pensions or even defined contribution pensions are harder to get. Uh, it's no wonder there's international and national discussions now on a guaranteed annual income. And I need to remind people as I get older and not everybody remembers these things, Newfoundland Labrador, the Economic Recovery Commission, did a national leading project on looking at a, a provincial pilot on guaranteed annual income. Doug, Doug House led the charge and the team, Doug May, Al Hollett, Patty Powers, a massive amount of work with a ton of economic modeling and it didn't get advanced at the time. Maybe conditions have caught up to where that team was trying to get us at that point. And it's a tangly big issue on uh, how we address the reality of the reshaping of the economy. And uh, we need to get there. Keep all these things in mind when you think about the discussion groups afterwards on uh, priorities using the results of this report and also priorities for future reports. Home is where you make it. So in this section, we are interested in looking not only at why people come to Newfoundland Labrador, but why they stay here. I often use that in performance reviews of staff when you get that together once a year. It's a great question when you ask about a workplace. Why do you stay here? Well, we should be saying the same thing to people who move to the province, because that really helps you understand, which we often don't appreciate, what is really good about the place, but also where, where we need to improve. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, maybe, Newfoundlanders have the highest, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have the highest likelihood of staying in place. We have a lot of great work going on now led by Barb Neese at Memorial on remote commuting. So people keep their home in their community. They still live there and their family does, but a lot are doing that long distance commute either within the province or beyond. Uh, John, could I get a drop of water, please? <clears throat> so 89% of people who currently live here were born here. Yeah, I'm not sure if, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> we're good friends. Yeah. <laughs> They're taking care of me. There's real community here. And there is. Thank you, Dave. 80% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have lived in their current community for more than 10 years. Uh, thanks a million. Yes, all right. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. That's pretty cool. I've never seen a podium with a little glass hole there. That's great. <laughs> so there's various ways of feeling a sense of belonging. I could, <laughs> I, I could tell you a great story about what my daughter said when she was 10, but I, <laughs> later on. At the same time, there are opportunities for newcomers in this province. When we look at the demographics, 
we absolutely know it's imperative that we attract and retain people who have moved away to come back from elsewhere in Canada to come here and from around the world. And uh, Helena has done work as part of our population project with Tony Fang in our economics department on some of the activity in Labrador and the opportunities there for newcomers. And uh, it's province wide. We're in a downturn right now that's mitigating some of the challenge. I guarantee it's gonna pick up with the demographic and the economic trends. So uh, it's really important for us to drill into this information. Really interesting, you know, residents who say they live in a welcoming community tends to be greater. And we only have this with the data source for uh, metropolitan, area, metropolitan area areas, Bay Roberts area, Grand Falls area, Corner Brook area, St. John's area. Interesting, Corner Brook lower than St. John's, even though it's a fair bit smaller. But each, each community has a, a different sense of community in place. Um, and again, I mentioned the stats about how long people have lived in their particular community. That's great for bonding and sense of place, but it also, the anthropologists talk about uh, social capital and being able to link. We have strong bonding capital between us, but we have weaker bridging capital. And you know, we often, someone breaks down on the highway, you'll stop and help them in a second. Will you invite them home for dinner or for tea? The smaller the community, the more likely. But if you're uh, a newcomer to a place, breaking into that network can be heard. And we will have some more on that uh, coming up here. I love this quote from Jose Rivera with the Refugee and Immigrant Advisory Council. Rather than striving towards inclusion and tolerance of refugees, so just think about that first sentence, rather than striving for inclusion and tolerance of refugees, we aim for participation and ease of navigation within this province and Canada as a whole. This encourages a sense of belonging. It's not something to be tolerated, something to be integrated and embraced. Rather than creating a new space for these individuals, we welcome them into existing space and help with any obstacles that may arise, arise along the way. And so there's a lovely story in there about an art gallery initiative by uh, REAC, helping newcomers build a portfolio and promoting diversity in the community. And I think there's loads of ways that there are existing spaces that people are already being welcomed into. Some of my favorite examples, you go to, and I keep saying it, so once I get a line I like, go to Middle Cove when the Capelin are running. I do it every year. It's one of my favorite things. You go there today and it's full of people from around the world. And they're mixed in with all the local people and all the townies who go out there. And they're all having a ball, doing something that's core to the traditional sense of Newfoundland and Labrador identity. And everybody's loving it. Uh, farmers markets, and we have another uh, section on that, are an amazing blend of people who uh, are from local, mixing together with people who are from elsewhere in Canada and from around the world. And, and we'll come back to food as a real bonding. Mun does a great job bringing international students tobogganing in Pippi Park. They have a hoot. And it's connecting to stuff we just take for granted. So I think there's loads of ways we can be doing that in workplaces, in the arts, in sports, in culture, and with Caitlin. Crime and safety, we featured a, a fair bit of this on our, in our initial vital signs in 2014. And it really goes back to, it's interesting though, the, the Newfoundland stats, and it maybe is a, an indication here of where the perceptions lag some of the stats, but you also have to be careful because it's very regionally based. So the, the overall provincial stats, most Newfoundlanders and Labradorians feel safe in their neighborhoods, but most of our crime rates are higher than the Canadian average. And note that our crime rates, although higher than average, are not the highest in Canada. They're higher in Western Canada, actually. Thanks, John. Uh, and there has been a great deal of attention paid to drug crime in the province in recent years, but it is on the decline since 2011, and even then did not exceed the Canadian average. But again, the Northeast Avalon has very different stats than the rest of the province. And uh, in fact, the next slide drills into how police forces are being much more proactive and getting involved with communities. And Ainsley mentioned the story we have in this year's Vital Signs, working with the Halapu First Nation, with the RNC. And it's a really lovely story about how that proactive, positive work can help build some of those bridges and build the trust. 
uh, and we have some expert commentary there on sexual violence and reporting on sexual violence and news just in uh, the media this morning about a new committee on violence against women and girls. So much more awareness and willingness to address those issues. Neighborhoods, people in your neighborhood. 73% in Newfoundland and Labrador live in single detached houses, uh, way higher than the, uh, the national average. And uh, traditionally we've had the reality in Newfoundland and Labrador where we had the highest rate of home ownership in North America. And uh, largely because of the informal economy and rural people being able to build and uh, access local lumber, that's changing. And so when we think about density of urban areas and some of those factors, is that working against us or is it still a strength that we have? And that's about values. It's also about municipal planning. Uh, we need to unpack that stuff. Um, there is a lot to be said for, and I'm so glad we have uh, His Worship John Norman here today. He cringes when you say that, the new mayor of Bonavista. But he and many are highlighting the real significance of urban design and the impact that has on the way our neighborhoods enable us to form connections with our neighbors and other people in the community. It doesn't just happen by chance. And there's <laughs> decades of years of experience in planning around the world that we can draw on. And in our province, historically, planning has not been prominent. And there are some real nice examples around the province now where it is. But designing in those public spaces, walking trails, organizing local festivals, sports can play a key role. Um, kids are a key way that neighbors connect with each other. And there's fewer kids now. People are having fewer kids. A lot of families aren't having any. So we need to think of ways to make those connections. And when you see those national stats, if 50% don't think it's necessary, uh, just raising the awareness of no person is an island. Uh, but how do we facilitate those connections? And how do we make that raise that awareness? It has to be deliberate. It has to be intentional. If we just keep running full out in our little lives, it won't happen. And so there are great examples around the province. It takes leadership, people like John in, in Bonavista with many other leaders. Um, town of Bonavista and the whole Bonavista Peninsula is highlighted in a, a story in this year's Vital Signs. And you know, one of the, the buzzwords these days is about place making. And again, you know, place, you know, you just take it for granted. That's that's where the buildings are and the geography is, can't affect that. Absolutely, you can affect that. And so there are urban design principles, and they don't have to be in large urban. In fact, there's great, you go around Newfoundland and Labrador. I mean, I had a, a fellow here from Indiana on the weekend, took him out to Holyrood and Brigus and did that drive. Holyrood and Brigus are beautiful examples of very small communities with a real sense of place and design. Uh, Grand Falls, Windsor has been very proactive in the last few years, trying to plan around that but it's about being intentional, it's about planning, it's about adopting good practice. And I look forward to hearing John on some of the inspirational stuff they've done in, in his community. The gap between rich and poor, we heard more on that in uh, Ainsley's presentation on the national level. We've dealt with it in previous uh, vital signs and it continues to be a compelling issue in the modern world. Uh, there's lots of good stuff in the social sciences around how in the post-war period and since the Industrial Revolution, the way the economy was organized changed from the pre-Industrial Revolution. And we've been through several phases of the Industrial Revolution. The regulatory framework adapted to match it. And we have a, had a collective bargaining system, government policies that matched that way of the economy operating. But the economy has changed again, and we're trying to play catch up with the regulatory system that matches that. And the gap between rich and poor, I think, is a reflection of that. And maybe the guaranteed annual income is one mechanism, but I think there's a lot of others that we need to be thinking about. Despite all that, because of the boom we just were through in the last 10 years, uh, and we have a, a great quote from Doug May on the next slide, over the last 10 years, medium, median income, so half the people are above it, half the people are below it, increased. And the percentage of people living in low income in Newfoundland and Labrador declined. 
since 2005. As Doug notes, and this is a great quote, those 10 glorious years when have not for most people was no more. And we'll see that during that time, there were still many people still suffering in our province with have not. But for many, many, many people in this province, rural and urban, we were living the dream. We just had to look at the, the big box stores and the car dealerships and you name it. Um, Doug is asking whether the next 10 years will be so kind. And uh, I'm an eternal optimist, and I think there's loads of opportunity in this province, but we need to look at how we revitalize the economy and how we catch up the regulatory, the compensatory, the taking care of each other system. Really interesting numbers here. I was fascinated by these. On economic mobility, there's this great dream in the US of A that anybody can become anything, Horatio Alger. I always liked the line when I was in the UK. Uh, a kid sees a Cadillac go by in, uh, in New York, poor kid, and says, I'm going to have one of those someday. The kid in Britain sees one, and they throw a rock at it. <laughs> it's not necessarily the case anymore. Maggie Thatcher tried to change all that, for good or for bad. But this perception of mobility is key to our liberal economy. And in fact, the stats are really interesting. So economic mobility, chance that children raised by parents in the bottom fifth of incomes will stay in the bottom fifth. In Newfoundland and Labrador, 32%. But they will stay in the bottom fifth. But that means 68% are moving out of the bottom fifth, which is really encouraging. Equally interesting, the chance that children raised by parents in the top fifth of incomes will stay in the top fifth, 29%. So it's actually less. So there's a higher chance of kids born in. So we think of privilege. Now that's the top fifth and the bottom fifth. There's a whole bunch in the middle. But it's really interesting, and it's partly a reflection of the change of work and the precarious income. Because previous generations, since the war, felt that kids automatically took it for granted that your kids were going to have a better life than you did. And then the chance that children from parents in the bottom fifth of incomes will rise to the top fifth. So this is going from the bottom right to the top. The Horatio Alger is 8.7%. Uh, so it shows some mobility, but certainly not that would reflect some of the myth around uh, work hard, be smart, make the right decisions. There's a lot of factors that inhibit that movement. But that's what education, that's what the regulatory system, that's what the compensatory system Equality of opportunity, hopefully, is what we're, we're trying to achieve. But that gap is real, and it persists. And during the boom, and even more today, uh, food bank usage, not everyone prospered. And there's really nice profiles, nice in the sense that they're really telling, not necessarily happy stories, of different profiles of people living in poverty in our province, in our city, and in elsewhere in the province. And Lisa Brown, with uh, one of the key leaders with uh, Vital Signs, great partner with the Harris Center, one of our associates, uh, helped inform this from her work with Stella Circle. And uh, I think those profiles are, are really great snapshots into some of the realities that all of us can relate to. And low-income low Newfoundlanders and Labradorians come from many backgrounds and life circumstances. And food bank usage is still really high. And some of the recent discussions we've had on this, actually, maybe looking forward to future vital signs, but we'll see where the discussion goes today. It would be interesting to look at the impact of the tax system on the gap between rich and poor. There's been a lot of debate in the media of late about uh, small business and the tax system and the rich having too many breaks. I remember back under Cretchen's time, I think, seniors' poverty was really targeted, and the tax system was adapted to uh, address that. And I know some seniors who actually feel like they're doing okay with th some of those benefits, but I don't even do my own taxes, so it would be so complicated. So it would be really interesting to look maybe at each of those profiles of people in low income and families and seniors 
and then look at, well, where were they? How was their treatment in the tax system 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago today? It's really messy, so we'd need help sorting it out. I think that would be pretty powerful. And you could do it for business, small and medium size versus large. You could do it for municipalities, local service districts versus uh, incorporated. Might be a lens that would be worth uh, exploring. Community and civic engagement. So voting, activism, volunteerism are some of the ways people in this province take action to make their communities better places to live. And note that's an active verb. It's doing things to make them better places to live. Uh, we have higher than average volunteer rates in this province. Our volunteer sector is bolstered by a small number of people who contribute many hours of their time. And uh, that's often the case in any community. A few people wearing a lot of hats and those hats get pretty heavy on your head if you, and so there's volunteer burnout. So the more people we can involve, and one of the key things volunteers need to do is learn how to get other people involved in a small way initially. I, I, and you shouldn't live your life by bumper sticker mottos, but one I saw recently was really good is if you want to feel good, do good. And so volunteerism is such a great way to get involved in the community, improve the community and benefit yourself. Uh, and there was a lovely story in, uh, in this year's Vital Signs on the human shield at the mosque in St. John's and there were some in other Newfoundland and Labrador communities showing support for the Muslim community. So there's lots happening that's positive, but we need to be very intentional about fostering more of it. The next slide builds on this further um, in terms of the formal participation as civic engagement in elections. The federal and provincial voter turnouts in 2015 suggest voting is influenced by residents' level of emotional engagement. How much does this election matter? Do I believe in the candidates? Uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians were fired up by the federal election. We had a pretty rocky road there for a decade in federal politics, but they were less engaged in the provincial election. And we have some nice expert commentary there from James McLeod with the telegram on civic engagement. Uh, we didn't get the municipal turnout uh, for our recent municipal elections in time for this vital signs, we'll, we'll have that for next year. But even in the recent federal election, while we had a higher turnout than the previous federal election, so we're all fired up, we still had the lowest in, in the country. So there is a view among some social scientists, and I often rattle on about this, there's a lower sense of democratic efficacy in Newfoundland and Labrador than in most places in the Western world. And it's a product largely of our history, the way we were settled, and the role of the church and the merchant, and then Uncle Ottawa, and these dynamic premiers who are gonna solve everything for us. And it's interesting when asked, why didn't you vote? Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, top four reasons for not voting in the 2015 federal election. 36% said, not interested in politics. Politics is this dirty word. Does that mean you're not interested in roads or taxes or health care or, or, or? So the, the uh, Democracy Cookbook, I think it's called, that the Harris Center helped foster with a memorial presents, and then Alex Marlin and Lisa Moore took hold of it. Telegram has done a great job publishing it. Varying perspectives, getting people thinking about democracy. And sometimes I am really busy, all the times I'm really busy, and I think I, I can't get out and vote, it's, you know, I gotta do this. And you think, you look around the world at the people losing their lives to have the chance to vote. And how we, we're so plugged in globally now, how we can avoid that is unbelievable. So a lot of work to be done, and maybe the democracy cookbook and a lot of other things will help us get there. Mental health and addictions, another key area that uh, we've covered in previous vital signs, but also had requests to take a deeper look and really timely talk topic. Uh, currently, our population has high levels of stress, and certain groups like seniors and LGBTQ community are at risk for mental health challenges. So that's written up in, uh, in this version of vital signs. Really interesting about the high stress in Newfoundland and Labrador versus the rest of Atlantic. This one here. Um, 
It's dropped since 2016, where it was 35%, said they had high levels, to 30% this July, which also is really interesting. So was it with uh, the uncertainty of that period, the angst after the drop in oil prices? Uh, really hard to know uh, why it would have dropped, but still much higher than elsewhere. And more on mental health and addictions. Uh, Consumers Health Awareness Network, Newfoundland and Labrador, doing great work. And there's a real nice quote there on how we need to be more aware of this. And as with most things, talking about it is key. Um, and as I say, we had a good story on this in last year's Vital Signs rework in uh, Stephenville area. So uh, Channel doing a great job, lots of community organizations, but making it much more open, uh, something we can face. All these, as with every year's vital signs, it's highlighting good things, highlighting some of the challenges, some of the success stories in dealing with the challenges. Food is a recurring topic and uh, it's, it's a real great interest in the province these days. We all need it. But the local food movement is booming in this province. There's farmers markets and community gardens being established across the province. Again, you know, maybe it's a, a nice example of how so many of us and our families historically had their own gardens. Bowling alone was survival. But as people got less into that over the last several decades, the community benefits of community gardens, the, the sense of belonging, access to local food, healthier food, uh, is a great indicator of uh, we're moving in the right direction on that front. But a lot of people have done a lot of work in that area. Uh, what is scary, however, is the average age of farm operators in this province. And we know that we need a lot more food production in this province. Our Grenfell campus with industry is looking at a agriculture and food security strategy. Uh, and it's something the provincial government has uh, prioritized. So I think we're really starting to get traction on a lot of fronts on this. And again, food is a great way to create belonging. And again, you know, it starts, <laughs> I'm in a preaching mode here. I love vital signs. <laughs> I get a podium. Eat with your kids. If you have kids, eat with them. It's the single most important thing you can do. Conversation happens without it being forced. And your neighbors and newcomers. I mean, food is a real unifying, uh, breaking bread. Goes back a few years. And further on food, the, uh, the Enactus team at Memorial came second in the world this year, first in the country again, focused on food security and the uh, six Project Succeed, and it's spreading across the country and around the world, but again, because meeting that real niche. And a uh, nice quote there from the coastal Labrador, where we're starting to see in communities where it used to be really hard to get fresh vegetables, more of it available. So there's lots of success happening in this area. And a lovely quote from Dale Jarvis, uh, Heritage Foundation, Newfoundland Labrador, on some of what I've been saying, how food really is a unifying, it brings sense of belonging. It's got that historic link, but it's got international links. Uh, it's, it's great stuff. Online, which is ubiquitous, and it cuts across all these areas we're talking about. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> we're finding, well, before I get to that, Okay, I gotta speed up a few of my anecdotes. People are finding community online in lots and lots of ways with shared interest groups, using internet to keep in touch with friends and family. Anybody who thinks the internet isn't alive and well in rural Newfoundland, I tell you, Facebook just burns the wires off. So many people away and in town and keeping in touch. It helps with family, it helps with educational opportunities, it helps in rural, it's absolutely essential for small and medium-sized enterprise, economic diversification. And yet, we still have real challenges with wireless coverage, high speed. It's a nice quote from Rob Wells at Memorial Works in this area. Um, there are efforts, and government, I know, is continuing to prioritize it. Can't be fast enough. Sports and recreation, again, another great way to enhance sense of belonging, interacting, but also health benefits. We've highlighted in previous vital signs about obesity rates, instance of uh, diabetes and, and the like. Newfoundlanders are getting active 
and there are lots of examples of organizations helping with this. Uh, and in fact, despite stereotypes of lazy teenagers, our youth are the most active demographic in the province. So teenagers are coming out pretty well in this, uh, this year's vital signs. Further on sports and recreation, there's a nice profile there of public recreation facilities around the province and that we have municip municipal spending, which is often matched with provincial, uh, higher in Newfoundland and Labrador uh, than elsewhere in Atlantic Canada, which is great. But with our demographics and with our fiscal situation, we know there's going to be a challenge in the future. But it's again why municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador and the province are advancing discussions on regional government, maybe regional facilities, and there are many now, uh, will be the way of the future. And Jason and the YMCA, uh, there's a lovely story in there on the great work they're doing in Marystown. And it's a real nice model of a municipal NGO partnership where the M YMCA does the operations for the Y there, but Marystown is the owner of the building. And I think there's similar discussions with other municipalities around the province. So we need to learn how to partner and do more with less and leverage the strengths in the respective organizations. And, uh, and it's happening. On the environment, if that fails, none of the rest matters. Uh, and we have some stats there, you know, on the restructuring of the fishery. We featured the fishery several times in, uh, in Vital Signs. And the number of commercial fishing license holders dropping year after year, reflecting the restructuring of the fishery, reflecting the restructuring of rural Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, the impacts that has on families and communities and on our province. Um, we have to factor that into our understanding of the changing nature of new. So the fishery isn't going to go away, but it's being done in a different way. Uh, Glenn Blackwood at Marine Institute always says, we can get the fishery right. We have a never ending mega project. Getting it right is a challenge. Meanwhile, hunting and recreational fishing remain central aspects of Newfoundland and Labrador identity and debate. Got to get me moose. Salmon fishing, cod fishing, recreational cod fishing as the cod come back. And these are great ways for people, food security, but also get your kids involved, get newcomers involved. Further on the environment, interesting debate these days with the talk on regionalization, with people defending local service districts. And they like their way of life and they wanna be left alone and you can understand it. But a lot of them are depending on well water and the research the Harris Center has done with RBC support over the last 10 years. Um, well water means you better be careful because it's not regulated in the same way as municipal drinking water. And the stats on the quality of well water and the testing are really bad. And people can get their own water tested, but they just assume it's okay. And a lot of the research has indicated it's not. And so when we look at the whole debate on local service districts, it gets right to the heart of our understanding of liberal democracy. It's citizenship versus self-sufficiency. It's individual freedom versus collective responsibility. And you know, with the state of our provincial government finances, our mentality because of our history has been to look for government, federal, provincial, to take care of us. And they still have an absolutely essential role. But maybe the situation we're, we're in is meaning we have to take care of each other more. And that will enhance belonging. So I'm always glass half full. I think necessity is the mother of invention. We have to address these issues in new ways and we're gonna to have to take ownership of them. So before Kathy pulls the plug on me, uh, a ton of people put a ton of work into making Vital Size happen. It's done on a very low budget. We can't thank our, our supporters and partners enough. Uh, on the project team, I wanna highlight Ainsley, as always, has done a, a key, key role for us. Uh, Zarin Healy-White, is Zarin here? Oh. Well, Zarin filled in for Kathy while Kathy was on maternity leave doing our, her part for our fertility rates. And so Zarin did a lot of the work on this year's Vital Signs. Kathy came in in her usual manner and did a fantastic job on the, the finishing up. Eleanor Swanson with the Community Foundation puts a lot of work into this. And Helena Sapia, our postdoctoral fellow, has done a great job over the years and she'll be on the panel coming up. Uh, Steve Bartlett mentioned to me as we we're talking at the beginning here, Maybe we should do some work on impacts of vital signs now that we're into it four years. And the Harris Center does evaluation all the time. There's a great program in psychology at MUN uh, where they train students in quantitative and qualitative evaluation. So I think we could do some work on that. Uh, but one little indication of an impact, and I asked him if I could tell this story, almost done, Kathy, 
is Justin Deering. Just got hired at the Harris Center. He was with Alumni Affairs at Munn. And uh, he, went, he was at the Marine Institute. Then he went away and worked with Students on Ice, I think it was. Went to the Antarctic, having a great life. And he was home for the summer. And he stopped at the Irving, I think it was, in Deer Lake. And I'm a bit of a freak with vital signs. So I take a bundle whenever I travel on the highway. We go up to Millertown a fair bit, sometimes up the corner rook, and I drop it off at gas stations. And he saw the vital signs at the Irving and Deer Lake when he was home for the summer and read about some of the challenges with youth unemployment and crime and drugs. And he said, I got to be back here. I got to be helping Newfoundland and Labrador. He's a man on a mission, like everybody at the Harris Center, and I think like, like everybody in this room, men and women on a mission. And so, Steve, there is one very clear life-changing impact that Vital Signs has. So just think of how many examples there are after four years. So I can't wait to do that evaluation. And uh, again, uh, thanks to all our supporters. Thanks to all the team who put it together. And thank you all for coming here. I look forward to the panel and the Q&A, and especially the breakout sessions after. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's that's okay. That's okay. So uh, uh, we're very very uh, the Telegram, the Western Star, uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador Community newspapers. We're very very excited about having this uh, this publication in in our papers and on our websites uh, in the in the coming days. Uh, it's it's vital information for the people in Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's also uh, a real great uh, uh, simulator of conversations and hopefully a simulator of action, which is ultimately what we want uh, from this. And uh, so, I mean, I've, I've never, I've spent uh, my career uh, trying to tell stories uh, about things that matter to people, but when I see a graph with two sneakers, that does a better job than I can with words. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of humbling, but anyway. Uh, so we're going uh, to thank thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to be involved, and uh, we look forward to growing the partnership and doing more and uh, helping the people of the province uh, uh, grapple with some of their challenges and also uh, celebrate some of their successes. Uh, so now we're going to uh, convene the panel. So I guess. Uh, I'll call them up, maybe. Uh, and when I read your name, you can just go take a seat. How's that? Uh, so the first panelist will be Halina Sapia, uh, and she is the lead research, lead researcher for this year's Vital Statistics or Vital Science, sorry. Uh, and she's a, a research fellow with the Stephen Jaroslawski team uh, at Memorial University and the Harris Center. Uh, she's doing research on immigration and public policy. So, Halina. Uh, next up, we have Jason Brown, and he's the CEO of the YMCA of Newfoundland and Labrador and has been since 2015. Uh, the YMCA delivers programs across the province for people to be healthier and more active, uh, to access childcare, to find a job, and to start a business. Thank you, Jason. And we have Lisa Brown, and Lisa is the CEO of Stella Circle, a community organization offering housing, counseling, and employment services. She's an active community volunteer has served as the deputy mayor of the town of Clarenville and is chair of the this, this Center for Social Enterprise Advisory Board at Memorial University. And last but not least, we have John Norman, uh, who's with Bonavista Living and Bonavista Creative and is recently uh, the elected mayor of Bonavista. Thank you, John. So I'm, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna ask each, uh, each of the panelists a question and I'll start with uh, Helena. Helena. When you when you compiled this report, I'm just wondering what the most what's resonated with you most. What's the 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 nugget of information or the fact that has stayed with you, uh, good or bad? Well, the um, overarching theme of the report is, of course, sense of uh, sense of belonging. And uh, so, um, as Rob has mentioned, so we have some positive. Uh, um, signs um, in the province, but at the same time, um, uh, 
uh, I can also um, notice uh, some uh, worrisome trends. Uh, I guess because of the changing economic situation. So, for example, if you look at uh, through the report, of course, you can see there is most people are more likely to feel stress. They are less likely to do major purchases. But um, even our graph uh, from Stats Canada that actually shows the progression uh, over time, you can see that even though, for example, ten glorious years, uh, even though the uh, median income was going up and the low income percentage of people in low income um, was going down. If you look at the last like years indicated on our graphs, uh, there is a, a chance that the trend would actually change, that the um, it will go upwards for low income and might go downwards for median income. So of course we'll know more probably next year when we get the most recent stats and also um uh in a, in a month or so statistics canada is going to release more census data on income so that would be very interesting to see what's going on in this very last period but um, um at the same time also we could see that the percentage of people who are using food banks is also slightly rising um and um in this regard, um, the picture uh, might, uh, might be uh, a little bit worrisome. And, but I don't want to sound pessimistic. Um, as, um, as, was mentioned, as it was mentioned before, um, Newfoundland uh, and Labrador um, indicator for sense of belonging, uh, especially local uh, sense of belonging to local communities is, is um, actually quite strong. And I think in this regard, um, people should build on their strength. And I think sense of belonging is not only how you perceive that you belong, but people should think of the community in general in terms of um, um, their compatriots, compatriots in this province. And when we talk about that no one should be left behind, uh, uh, they should be more understanding about people who are struggling. And it's not only about your volunteering and uh, the number of hours people are putting uh, into doing good things, uh, but uh, there is a really, there is an opportunity, as Rob said, the necessity <laughs> is innovation, and there is an opportunity now to turn things around uh, to, and think about uh, potential ways to uh, generate opportunities for young people and uh, people who are stuck in the precarious in this precarious lifestyle. So, on the one hand, um, I might sound pessimistic, but on the other hand, I think uh, the way forward is, of course, to um, Mm, think about the ways uh, to to try to uh, t change the trend until it's too late. Okay, so the uh, the stress uh, uh, part of the project that that str strikes me because I uh, in in work and uh, and my my personal life I see lots more stress today than ever. I think we're all feeling a crunch of time and technology and. It's impacting. Uh, so a great way, this is my segue to Jason, a great way to reduce stress and to manage it better is uh, <laughs> recreation. Uh, so, so Jason, from your perspective, what, what, what part of this report uh, strikes you as, as a call to action or as a, or as a call for celebration? Well, I, I think uh, both a call to action and a cause uh, for celebration is, is page 13, uh, sports and recreation. And uh, I'm really pleased to have the Marystown YMCA story in there. That has really changed the lives very positively for hundreds, if not thousands, of people in Marystown and on the Buren Peninsula. I'm really proud of that project and that partnership with uh, the town of Marystown. I was interested to see how much higher than uh, the other provinces in Atlantic Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, municipalities spend on recreation and culture. I thought that was a bit, I didn't know that information before, and I think that's very interesting. Certainly a call to action is that adults, seniors, youth, while active, are still all below the Canadian average. And I think there's more that we can do to help people be healthy and active. Um, and it's hard to find time, and it doesn't always feel good until you stop, but exercise is important uh, for good health and long life. I also take a look at the volunteer information here, certainly at the YMCA. 
Our programs are generally delivered by volunteers. Uh, funds are raised by volunteers. Uh, it's really uh, it's really great to see, and, and certainly we see it in, in our operations, the high level of volunteer support across Newfoundland and Labrador. And then the economy is also something that's really interesting to me because uh, we know uh, that uh, our donations and donations to other charities are coming down uh, year over year as uh, the economic situation unfolds. We're also seeing a higher demand for people who need financial assistance to attend our programs. So that was good data for me as well, and an excellent report and really happy to be a part of it. Okay, thanks. And uh, Lisa, talk about higher demands and, uh, and in incomes and stuff. From your perspective, when you look at uh, vital signs and, and what you experience uh, th through your operation, uh, what do you think is, is again, a call to action or, or a call to celebrate? Yeah. Uh this is, hello. Uh, well, I think there always needs to be a pessimist in the room, so I'll play that role today. <laughs> the two stats that Ainsley talked about at the end of her presentation, I found really um, shocking and disturbing, I have to say, in terms of only half of Canadians think being involved in their community is important, and 38% don't feel like they have a stake in their local community, and 30% 6% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians don't vote uh, because they don't have any interest in politics. So they're really problematic stats. And I think if you take a look at people who are in low incomes and who are naturally excluded from their community anyway, maybe some of that is explained in those stats, but it makes it really difficult for people who maybe have mental health or addictions challenges or low incomes to then become part of their community. So I'd say that's one thing. The other thing that I think is really important to focus on is seniors. So we know that demographically, um, we're, we're getting older very quickly in this province and that that bubble is coming. And we also know that in the stat, it says one in four seniors will have a mental health issue. One of the big challenges we're seeing at Stella Circle now is because we've been better at uh, housing people who had previously been ho homeless, because we're getting better at mental health and addictions, people are living longer. So whereas people who have um, traditionally people who have mental health issues have been homeless, have not lived as long as people in the general population. They're living longer now. They're getting older. They're living in our apartments. They need a service that we traditionally have not provided, such as personal care, such as home support. And it's a big issue because there are people who have very complex mental health needs. So we have a number of situations now when we need to have uh, some of our seniors in personal care homes, but personal care homes have a choice. They can say thank you or no thank you to certain people. And so if you're given to uh, to health records and one person has schizophrenia and the other one doesn't, I think I know what you're likely going to choose. And some of that, though, uh, is because that uh, people who work in personal care homes don't necessarily have the training around mental health issues. So I think that's a really big issue. It's a big issue that we're facing at Stella Circle, and we've done some research in that area, and we um, are doing more research in that area. But it's a really big issue, and I, I think it, it certainly comes out in this report with the seniors in general, but also looking at the complexity of seniors. Thank you. And so my very first friend in life was named John Norman. Uh, I've never met this gentleman before, but we're going we're to shake hands after. Uh, so, so John, uh, you're the, uh, the new mayor uh, of a, uh, a town that seems to, in the past few years, bucking the, the trend of rural decline uh, and seeing some growth and some, uh, a lot of optimism. What, uh, when you look through the vital science uh, uh, window, what do you see as the opportunities in rural Newfoundland now? Um, I think the uh, whole topic of belonging is uh, is very timely. Uh, for those who know the architect Robert Mellon, uh, myself and Robert actually co-hosted a lecture uh, just a month ago, and it was all about the belonging trend uh, and specifically geared toward millennials. And I was on a panel just last night and drove into St. John's at midnight last night from that panel. Uh, and uh, we had a showing uh, at the Bonavista Trinity Regional Chamber of Commerce of The Millennial Dream, uh, a film that maybe some of you have already seen, it's about a 40 minute film, very, very interesting. And it's about the 
the very much evolving and changing trends of millennials of 20 and 30 somethings and the importance they now place on belonging, uh, connection with community and moving away from the lifestyle that maybe many of their parents had a set career for 30 years, a guaranteed pension. Well, we don't have that many of us, even if we wanted it, but many of us are, are moving away from that trend. They want to be connected to place. They want to be connected to environment. And that then in turn creates opportunities, uh, specifically in rural Newfoundland, in the communities that are, are prepared and, and ready uh, for that trend. So Bonavista, and I'd like to think that I played a role in that over the last few years, has positioned itself as a real place to belong. We've created place, we've branded place. I won't go as far as say we've romanticized about place, but we have taken major capital from our place, our identity. And for a rural community like Bonavista, a little under 4,000 people, to see dozens and dozens of 20 and 30 somethings moving from St. John's, and a much more urban environment, to Bonavista annually over the last few years is quite an anomaly that ba uh, uh, Rob and uh, others at the Harris Center have been discussing with the Chamber of Commerce for a few years now. So really trying to pinpoint why that's happening. Well, a lot of it is, is laid out in, in vital signs. It's what we have, it's what we offer, it's what we're branding. And as I said, it, it presents many opportunities for many parts of Newfoundland that I don't think they're currently taking advantage of. Okay, so this is, I'll open this up to anyone on the panel who'd like to answer. If uh, no one wants to answer, I'll be pretty embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at the, uh, the high speed stats and we see 60% uh, of the population in the province not having access to high speed. Like I look at, uh, I remember my first internet connection, my uncle came down, this was 1995. He looked at, he looked at my machine, he said, this is the great equalizer. Right, what you have in your hands now is the great equalizer. But if we only have 60% of the population uh, able to access convenient internet connection, like how much, how much potential are we missing out on, or how much could, if we rose that to 80 or 90%, what kind of results could we see with a number of these issues? Because people would be able to research to find things to. <laughs> I hate to leave you hanging, so I'll yeah, jump in. A lot of <laughs> um, it brings up a number of interesting points. You know, uh, first of all, it, it assumes that people can read, and I think literacy is a big issue. Um, so, not to say that it wouldn't help, but I, th I think connectivity is really important. Um, but I think it's also important to raise issues around social media. And, um, you know, while it's meant to connect, it, it often has the opposite impact for people. So, um, you know, you, you tend to like friends or follow people who are like you. So who have the same opinions of you. So you surround yourself with people who have your same views. So what does that do to diversity, for example, or uh, bringing different perspectives to the table? Um, it also enables people to present themselves in ways that maybe isn't actually accurate or true. And, um, and that can be isolating for people as well. So again, I'm really pessimistic here today. I don't know what's wrong with me. I know, I went to the dentist this morning. It set me off on the wrong foot. So, uh, but really, just to say that, yes, I think con connectivity is really important. Uh, the stat is, is low, much lower than I thought it would be, actually. Um, drinking water is the same thing. You know, it's, uh, that's a huge issue in this province, shockingly huge. And um, so, so, so Steve, yes, I would say that, you know, connectivity is a, is a positive thing to have, uh, to have it increased, but it, it's not the panacea of uh, all solutions and it brings its own issues to it. For sure, for sure. Uh, and in terms of uh, the immigrant uh, part of this, what do you think we need to do better as a population or as a bureaucracy, even if they get the, the province involved, to, uh, to grow the immigrant population and to also make them feel more welcome? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'm working on immigration issues, so uh, the main, main, um, the main uh, reason why people would come and stay is, um, of course, having a job. And um, if there are no job opportunities, uh, people would eventually leave. And it's true for both uh, international migrants and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador-born population. And it's also uh, true for interprovincial migrants, how to attract people from other 
provinces to Newfoundland and Labrador. So, of course, on the one hand, um, there should be uh, job opportunities here. At the same time, people could come and uh, create job opportunities for themselves and uh, hire <laughs> others. So, um, one way, uh, probably the not the easiest way, but uh, one solution could be, of course, is to simplify the procedure for people to stay. For example, uh, our team uh, has been talking a lot about uh, uh, pathways for international students, um, people who are already here and uh, they they educated in Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, I know that the provincial government. Um, is working on this, but um, yeah, and it's, it does not depend only on the provincial government because immigration is a shared jurisdiction uh, in Canada, federal and provincial. Uh, but um, simplifying ways for uh, international students to stay um, would increase this pool, e even though uh, some of them eventually will would leave. But the more people you accept, the more people. Let's say even if we say the retention rate is. 70%, 50%, or even 30%, if you accept 1,000, it's you, you'll get more people say that, uh, uh, compared to accepting, like let's say, 500, right? So um, you can't guarantee that people would stay, but at least to increase this pool. Um, same thing, there are um, temporary foreign workers. Once again, if there are easier ways for people to stay here and uh, the predictability as well. It's also very important to link it to sense of belonging. Uh, um, people, when they have a um, more predictable status, they know that there is a pathway to stay permanently in Newfoundland and Labrador. People would think they would, uh, in terms of uh, investing into the community, getting more engaged, building social capital in the province while being students or temporary foreign workers and then they would be able uh, to stay because uh, not only um, economic factors are important for retention but also um, social integration factors. Um, there, are, there is research uh, that, say that uh, says that um, uh, social integration factors could outweigh sometimes uh, economic considerations and uh, to what extent it's true but uh, people sometimes if they feel uh, that they belong they feel good uh, they might uh, prefer staying in the place where they have friends than going and just trying to find maybe a better job maybe not and friend is also a, a one of the important factors why people stay in the place it um it, it was confirmed by results from surveys immigration surveys in australia and canada so that's uh, also very important and that's why when we're talking about um mm, that people are more isolated, they feel they don't, they don't need to belong and invest in their communities. Uh, that also creates some um, obstacles, because if, especially for newcomers, and I would say both for international migrants and migrants from other places in Canada, when they come and um, they, uh, they exactly, nobody invites them for a cup of tea. They, they are not in the networks. So why, uh, they would think, why would they stay? And sometimes this could even outweigh economic considerations. If people feel isolated, they would they would not stay. So um, it's a complex issue. But at the same time, um, my advice would be to increase the pool, bring more people. See, some of them would definitely stay, and uh, hopefully. Um, you get more entrepreneurial people who would create um, businesses and hire other people. Okay, thanks. And uh, Jason, what do we need to do to encourage uh, a healthier population? Like, it, you know, obviously so, some of those numbers are, are encouraging, but I think there's still a lot of room for growth and that would pay off uh, for the economy, it'd pay off for our healthcare system. There's, there's a lot of benefits to it. So, so what do you think? What, what would you advocate for? Or what are you advocating for? Mm. Well, and I, and I think that um, our own information at the YMCA indicates that people that are involved in healthy, active lifestyles, feel better, um, have more connections to others, uh, have uh, achieved a goal, whether it's uh, uh, being able to, um, to go on a, a walk, on a hike, uh, or go for a run, or run a marathon, or lose some weight, or learn how to swim. 
Uh, and all of those things are really important to being healthy and active. We also know that people who are healthier and more active are less likely to become engaged in the healthcare system. So we're doing a study with the Harris Center actually in Marystown uh, around the before and after of people uh, in population health uh, on the Buren Peninsula before and after the YMCA was there. So what is a picture of population health before a couple of years in? What is a self-reported uh, population health uh, for people who are involved in the YMCA? We expect to see uh, population health improve. And we're hopeful that that is a sign that we can use uh, in other communities for government investment in helping people be more healthy and active uh, to decrease their engagement in the healthcare system and to lower costs. Okay, thanks. And Lisa, at uh, at Cello Circle, what do, what do you think is the uh, is is the biggest thing that the province could do, not only benefit your organization, but to encourage other organizations uh, like it to to form or to benefit from? Mm -hmm. Um, to follow up on Jason's uh, comments, I guess, um, you know, the community can do things a lot more efficiency, efficiently, I think, and, um, and it's important, you know, one of the stories I tell is, uh, is a woman who um, was in prison for two years while she awaited trial, and uh, to, to house someone in prison is $298 a day. That's the figure that's used in the province. And uh, we worked with her and did assessments and you know went through everything to make sure that what we're doing was appropriate and safe for all involved. And uh, so we had her in, in one of our facilities for the same amount of time that she was uh, in, in jail. And so th the cost to the taxpayer for the time she was in jail was $220,000. And the time that we looked at, uh, the amount of money that she was with us in our facilities and, and that covered uh, income support and any transportation costs and food and in our programs was about 65,000 for the same amount of, of time period. So what I like to talk about is, because sometimes people, when you talk about <laughs> marginalized people like women in, in prison, for example, some people will say, well, you know, they should be in prison. If they did a crime, I don't care, they should be in prison. That's one perspective. Um, but we're seeing a lot of women in particular who are in prison now for the first time ever, driven a lot by addictions and mental health issues. And, you know, isn't it better to help them from a rehab perspective? And if the quality of life issue doesn't grab you, then the, the, the cost efficiency should. So uh, between, you know, those two segments. So to your question, I guess, Steve, I think I think actually trust is really important. So I think community organizations, and I think it's really interesting that the three of us here are community organizations representing community. So I think uh, working with government in terms of helping to uh, close down the silos, in terms of identifying issues, and having the trust to know that let's pilot some things. So let's be really socially innovative to see what is it that we can do to help make life better for individuals and consequently for communities as a whole. Okay, and John, uh, a, qu a question for you, and this is about engagement. So uh, t two questions really. So when, when all this new development and influx of people were, were was happening in Bonavista. How did the the longtime <laughs> residents, the eighty percent in the pie graph there, how, how did they react when, you know, all these new faces and new businesses and new ideas started showing up? <laughs> the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I just got voted in so it's safe to speak now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um well it was a challenge. Uh, obviously, uh, Bonavista is quite a unique uh, community, smallest urban community, largest rural community. So it, it's stuck right in the middle there. And it has thousands of people there that have lived there for generations and generations. And not a lot had changed for a long time. Uh, the work, the foundational work that was done in Bonavista specifically when it came to um, enhancing community vitality through our uh, historic built landscape, uh, business incubation, and so on. That started uh, slowly and fairly quietly uh, through not-for-profits uh, about 20 years ago through the Bonavis Historic uh, Townscape Foundation, Garrick Theater, and so on. So 
myself as a private business person coming uh, into the community and starting this work five, almost five years ago now, some groundwork had been laid, but the, the change was, and I think this was the real challenging piece for, for, for the local population to understand, the long time local population to understand was this wasn't a government project. This wasn't a not-for-profit. This was actually a business or a group of businesses that was here to help enhance the community, better brand the community, market what the community had to continue and grow community vitality. So originally there was little trust in, in what we were doing. I estimated we had a community engagement session in our very first year, not a lot of uh, businesses in rural land do this, I guess, but I thought I had to. And I would say eight in 10 were not trusting of what we were, we were up to. What do you mean you're gonna buy up dozens and dozens of old buildings and homes? What are you gonna do with them? Who's gonna move in? Where are they gonna come from? What are they gonna do to our quality of life? Uh, we put out 30 chairs for our first event. We had 88 show up and then it got even stronger from there. Um, what they really reacted to in the end were the tangibles. Four years later, uh, I got in as mayor on a ratio of two to one. So obviously that's a ringing endorsement of the work that's been done. So the trust has grown significantly. And as a result of the tangibles, what have we created as a, a group of companies and my other work in the not-for-profit sector in Bonavista? Vista, over 50 new jobs in two years dozens of new businesses opening. I mean, there's no town that in 16 months saw over 30 new businesses open in rural Newfoundland. Dozens and dozens of 20 and 30 somethings move in. So they see it. Bonavista, I think, is one of the only municipalities where uh, in the last three years, mill rates have been dropped twice, yet overall revenue at the town hall has increased significantly. So they can spend uh, more on recreation, culture, infrastructure, maintain and enhance a good quality of life and it not costing the residents really anything, only providing them greater opportunities. So I think we've had great success, but it, it was very carefully done. <laughs> okay, so so my next question for you would be- Before, um, you, before you go to your next question, yeah. I just want to make sure that there's enough time for the audience to, okay. to ask the questions. We've got a bunch coming in online and in Labrador oh. uh, that I want to make sure we get to. I'll be really quick okay. the next this, one. This is, this is <laughs> one I think is, uh, is just important for the, this whole process. <laughs> And that's about uh, engagement in the, the democratic process. Um, you're just elected mayor of, 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 of the town, you say two to one, a re-endorsement. How do we get other people to take that risk and put themselves out there and say, I'm gonna run for my council? Because I, I forget the number, but we had a lot of councils that were acclaimed uh, in the province uh, this year. And uh, I don't think uh, it's sustainable to, you know, so we're, we've reclaimed this year, next election, we don't have enough people to fill the seats. So how do we reverse that, that trend? Enhance the sense of belonging <laughs> in a lot of communities, the connectivity for the residents within the community. It's a good thing you brought that up. I'd like to point out that there's 255, 256 incorporated municipalities in Newfoundland. Bonavista was number one on voter turnout. We had almost 70% of residents turn out and uh, we had 16 running in our uh, election. Most other municipalities, including Clarenville on the peninsula, were, acc were acclamations. Uh, people were interested, involved, seeing opportunity and a future, but also seeing challenges, thus raising questions and encouraging them to, in their minds, make a difference, even if it's just ticking a box or not ticking a particular box. They saw particularly what I was doing uh, what our companies were doing and what some of the larger not-for-profits were doing in the community. And they obviously wanted to see more of it and they wanted to get out and make sure there was going to be more of that type of work happening. So uh, I think it's a good model to, uh, to follow in other municipalities. I mean, you see throughout the province, a lot of negativity based on our financial situation. Well, you can't change the numbers, but there are still opportunities. There are opportunities in urban, there are opportunities in rural. And that idea, very basic idea, needs to be sold to municipalities and to their citizens, because that's what I see really lacking in, in a lot of communities when I visit them now. Thanks. So, you question? For the people in the room, I guess, uh, are there any questions that we that you guys have remaining before I go to the ones online and in Labrador, just to? Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Dave Rudofsky, and uh, I'm an immigrant who came here 43 years ago. So I'm a Newfoundlander with a British accent. I also, for Lisa's benefit, started a club called the Positive Thinkers Club 29 years ago. And we're still running and active and very interested in some of the subjects. I'll keep this brief. Um, one of the challenges with any forum like this is that we come and we hear fantastic information that Rob and the rest of the group have put together. But one of the observations over the years that I've made is we fail to carry forward some of the ideas in principle and really work on them and focus on them to improve things in the future. Whether that means things improve because of us or in spite of us, that obviously depends upon sort of where you are. So I'm just gonna to throw to the provincial government in particular, the idea that they focus specifically on some of these ideas, immigrants creating jobs. I created many when I came to Newfoundland and that's an area that I think we should focus on and build upon. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is um, a wonderful opportunity for us. I think this is how we uh, create uh, and, and promote our wonderful province of Newfoundland and Labrador. John, I've been trying to meet you for a long time. Every time I get to Bonavista, uh, you're busy or tied up. Uh, some of my friends uh, work for you, and you are doing absolutely amazing. Um, I've just been, uh, I guess, uh, acclaimed uh, um, in, on the Bacaloo Trail, a uh, counselor. Uh, Small Point, uh, Broad Cove, Blackhead, and Adams Cove. So I'm bragging about you all the time and what you're doing, and, and we want to learn from you, definitely. Um, I just want to, I'm going to speak, um, I guess I'm sort of retired, but I do have a, a business, Coastal Cottages, on the Bacaloo Trail that I've uh, ran since 2006, and I, I book weekly, and I'm so, I started the Shed Experience uh, this spring, and I was overwhelmed. I'm just closing down now. It's been my best season ever. And it's about community coming together. Uh, I'm also um, uh, the vice president of EGAL Canada. And we've been doing some work in this province, making schools safe. I used to be a teacher myself. I believe we have to start in our education system. We hit, we're losing far too many kids. We have to begin uh, in kindergarten. And it's about a sense of belonging. And as a teacher, when I created a safe classroom, kids bloomed. And we don't need to worry about curriculum. When kids find their passion, we don't need to worry about them. And they become part of our community and engaging. Um, so that the mental health issue, I, I'm glad that our government is starting to address these serious issues because we're losing far too many. Um, I, I got so much to say, and I don't want to take up too much time, but we are on the right track. Um, I think in ways of um, coming together, like what you're doing in Bonavista, John, I know some of the difficulties, but I think that uh, some of the difficulties we are encountering and government's starting to talk about it is with uh, taxation. Uh, for example, uh, before uh, election, we had a town meeting and we had 50 seats and we had about 150 people show up. And um, even though nobody threw their hat in the ring, everyone was concerned because we're a community where we're looking at how do we tax. We've got 300 families. Uh, the majority of our families, uh, their houses were, um, you know, how do you tax? What the mill rate do you use when the community in Kingston and Western Bay and all of the other areas on the back of Lou Trail from Small Point to Old Perlican are, um, of course, without councils and this is where I see a problem as a, as a tourism operator uh, we're dealing with some issues in Western Bay where we have a, a guy that's that's uh, actually putting a road in through one of the huge marshes and uh, we have a beautification committee there that we formed in Western Bay and we've just done um, the boardwalk the lighthouse uh, uh, where we have kids and families painting boards and we're actually putting them on the boardwalk amazing stuff so I just had to speak here today because I'm excited about what we're doing here. This is this is how we put um, Newfoundland and Labrador on the map. I had people this year from Singapore, all across Canada and Brazil, Japan too actually, and they came to this province for one reason, because we have wide open space and we have, friend, well, for many reasons, but it's our culture and it's our people. And I got to just tell you just last story and I'm going to give the mic back. The family from Japan with four kids were here in June for 10 days. And it rained a lot of those days. And I used to see them hiking every morning. And I, 
like I sort of felt bad. I couldn't change the weather. And I went out one morning, and the, and the two little kids, I think they were six and nine, and I said, you know, God, I can't help the weather, and I'm so sorry you're here, you know, and I, I'm praying for sunshine and doing the sunshine dance. And the, the two parents spoke to me at, in a way that I'll never forget. They talked about, well, they asked me if I've ever been to Japan, and I said no. And they uh, since sent me pictures of the beaches in Japan and the, and the number of people that are on those beaches. You've got open space, it's clean air. It's the first time that we felt comfortable that our children are out walking around your community, and we don't need to worry about them. So we have something very special here. The shed experience is a taste of culture, a taste of, uh, uh, of local people. Every shed experience I did this year, John, and the people that rented my places wanted them, they all asked to meet the local people. And so I love what you're doing. And uh, thanks a lot for whoever's putting this all together because we're on our way to uh, making Newfoundland and Labrador one of the most uh, best places in the world to come. Um, I got the one question online um, before, actually it's uh, coming in from Labrador. Um, were there any particularly interesting findings that were Labrador or Happy Valley Goose Bay specific? Affordability for one, uh, as one example, looking for a Labrador context. Uh, I guess maybe Helena. Uh, well, uh, last year we had some, uh, I mean, that's the challenge with uh, putting together vital signs, right? Because um, when we search for uh, data, we rely mainly on uh, Statistics Canada data and um, when it comes to specific indicators, um, you have always um, StatScan data by province, by CMA, sometimes by, uh, um, uh, by sense agglomerations. As you see our report, like we had Bay Roberts, Corner Brooks, and Johnson, Grand Falls, uh, Windsor, uh, because uh, it's because of the <laughs> small um, sample sizes, right? Because uh, when the when the when a survey is conducted, they sample uh, people in each province, and then um, if you look at Newfoundland and Labrador, you get Newfoundland and Labrador sample, and it's not always you have enough um, respondents in those smaller communities that would uh, be enough to. Um, provide reliable data and uh, in, the, in such cases um, the, the data is, won't be released. Like um, I just want to clarify one thing, it doesn't mean that when we have this general indicators, it, it doesn't mean that uh, only people from St. John's and major areas are included. Actually it might be that uh, there were people, like maybe 10 people from uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay in that sample. And that's why you can't really um, use those 10 people and generalize that uh, uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, for example, we have this indicator, residents who know many or most of their neighbors. Let's say they, those 10 people from Happy Valley Goose Bay said that, let's say all of them n know their um, neighbors so that would be 100 percent but the number is so small that you can't really it, it's a, it's not a reliable number um so in it, and that's the challenge with smaller communities so how what could be done about it um uh it would be really great to see um uh like it, it, uh, i mean the province could do a survey, right? If you could do a provincial survey by provincial uh, stats office, then they could ensure that you have samples big enough in uh -huh. each community. Or it could be a private firm, polling firm, who would do survey and target those communities to get reliable data. Um, there are different ways to do it. We have now online surveys, phone, uh, it could be supplemented with um, phone surveys. So there are ways to do it, but it's not exactly our fault because when we um, uh, request data from Stats Canada, uh, we were glad to get even uh, census, uh, census agglomerations, right? Because sometimes we get only the provincial number. And if you can see, sometimes we include um, data by health uh, uh, region. And uh, I will give you just an example. Um, it's in the section on mental health and sense of belonging. So um, we included the numbers of people who feel strong sense of belonging and have uh, excellent or very good mental health. The, um, 
initial uh, plan was actually to include uh, people who have excellent and very good mental health, and then fair and uh, poor. And then you would see um, a bigger table and um, the idea was to present that there is association, obviously, some association between these two variables. The issue was that for some health uh, regions, the samples were uh, small, um, and then you, when you don't have enough respondents in a particular category, the data, usually when you get the data, it, there will be like even an, indi an indication that uh, use with caution, or data is too unreliable to be used. So I know I know it's those are technical issues, and it's not that uh, you would care about those issues, but uh, we do care. And as researchers, uh, we work with data that we have. I would love to, uh, that we could, uh, as a Harris Center or our team, just I would love to conduct a survey, the provincial survey, a provincial survey, and ask multiple questions that we have, and provide data by each community and especially for Labrador. We had the same challenge when we were working on Labrador projects as a population project with the Harris Center. That was also a challenge. It would be great to have the data, and that's one of the issues. And in our, um, one of our actually recommendations to the government was uh, to build up this capacity to have data for smaller regions. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, you're good? Yeah. Okay. I, I can give a brief Labrador context as well. The, the YMCA has agreements and letters of intent with Happy Valley Goose Bay and with the town of Labrador City uh, to bring services in partnership with municipalities to the population to help improve population health and to get people connected with each other and more engaged in their communities. Um, I feel like I stole Steve's job, uh, but that's only <laughs> because uh, we're running very, very low on time. So I think if there are any questions in the room, um, we can take one more question. If it's a comment, um, we're going to move right into the community conversation. So it's, and we'll only have a short bit of time for that. So there's lots of time for sharing ideas and comments in the community conversation bit. If it's an actual question for the panel, I can take one. <laughs> You're persistent. Well, let's remember that it's super and, and it's a question, but I think, um, and, and John, you touched on this. And we, we talked about that's what we're trying to brand to the people. That's what we're trying to show the people. The, the question, and Robbie talked about this, why are people sitting at home watching Netflix, sitting at home watching hockey instead of going out and playing hockey? Why aren't they going out and volunteering? And one of the reasons is, and is because Netflix looks great and it's done all this work to make you look at it. Oh, I want to go watch this show. And NHL hockey is so exciting. I don't want to go play hockey. I want to watch hockey. So how can we take these sectors, like the volunteer sector, like people moving the rural and land, like getting people out of, you know, Whatever they, whatever we need, we need them to do to become more of a community. How can we push that forward? These stats and stuff are incredible. It's great for this group to know, and for people watching online and people who pick up vital signs. But how do we get out to the general public that you need to go out and volunteer? You need to be healthier. You can move out to rural Newfoundland and do what you want. That I think that's a huge challenge. And having these stats are great. But how do we now push that out to the general public? That's my question. Yeah, sure. I can add something. For sure. Um, I think, again, it, it harkens back to that sense of belonging and, and the evolving trend, like you talk about Netflix, people staying indoors, uh, not so much connected to their environment, to their place. Um, I'll have to harken back to the presentation I did with Robert Mellon and some excellent examples he uh, highlighted from both Newfoundland, mainland Canada, and the U.S that maybe some people don't actually live in place. Maybe they suffer from placelessness. They, this is very uh, a sensitive area to, to tread in because uh, certainly there are people uh, that have moved to Bonavista Vista from St. John's that felt that they didn't have place in this particular municipality. Um, what you would see as a growing trend uh, from um, an urban geography perspective, an economic geography pr perspective, is that more and more people want to be connected, moving into a core area. So that is the direct opposite of the suburban sprawl that we see occurring in some of the larger urban metropolitan areas in Newfoundland. That predisposes people 
to automatically not be connected to place or space. If you're in a neighborhood of a thousand homes where all the homes are very similar, there is no community space and your general commute is to Walmart, that's not a place that doesn't create interaction and belonging to a community that suffers from placelessness. So municipalities, uh, I guess with some assistance from the province, but municipalities have to take it upon themselves to create and brand place and, and enhance that sense of belonging for their citizens and to attract new citizens. It is one of the number one reasons why people choose to where uh, to live where they want to live and play where they want to play this day and age in North America is that connection. And if your community doesn't have it, you're going to suffer long term. And I would just add to that is the complexity as well of uh, people who are marginalized. So, for example, uh, if you have mental health issues, uh, it's really easy to say, come on and come out and join this and join that. But the reality is, if you can't get out of bed in the morning, you're not going anywhere to, to build a sense of community. And uh, we have a, a choir at Stella Circle, which really looks to building that community and has really done it very successfully. Uh, so what started 10 years ago as Come for an Hour uh, with funding has developed now into uh, come at 5.30, get a cup of coffee, we'll start singing at 6, and then at 7.15 we're going to sit down together and have supper, and then you'll leave by 8.00. And so it's, they're there to sing, but really they're there to make friends, to get out of their apartment, to build that sense of community. So there are many ways to build a sense of community. And I think that the, the you know, we're, people are very complex. And I think we need to look at all of that complexity when we try and build communities and the whole discussion of inclusiveness as well. Oh no, you stole the job. <laughs> <laughs> I invite him to do it and I take it over. Um, I think we're going to wrap up the Q and A. Um, we still have a little bit of time we can dedicate to the community conversation. Um, we don't have a lot of time. If you want to stick around past twelve o'clock, we don't have to leave the room. And there are muffins, so you won't starve. Um, uh, so I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you very much for stepping in, and I'm sorry for stepping on your toes, Steve. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming out. And like I said, there's muffins and uh, snacks in the back, and we're going to sit at these tables down here if you want to stick around for the community conversation. I'm Jason. Nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you. I'm Paulina. I was uh, the person who put this. Nice, nice.